I want to start off by uh, showing you a short video clip. So this is just a short 15 second clip, but, it, but it'll give you an understanding of what the threat environment is that, that the agency was dealing with. So that was an FBI recreation of the improvised explosive device that Abu Muttalib attempted to detonate on Christmas Day 2009. Um, he hid that device in his underwear. Uh, it was a novel construction and concealment technique, not something that we had seen um, facing aviation in the past. And you can imagine the impact if that device had actually gone off, detonated successfully as Northwest Airline 253 was um, making its approach to land in Detroit on Christmas morning. Or you can imagine the catastrophic consequences of a device like that went off on board a commercial aircraft at cruising altitude. Um, likely the loss of the airplane and all of the crew and passengers. So the agency's response to that was, was pretty typical. It followed a pattern that we had seen in response to every advance in terrorism, device construction, and device concealment that was really intended to evade whatever the existing aviation security measures were faced. So in this instance, TSA rushed forward to enhance security specifically to detect this, this new and novel threat. So we changed the pat-down process, made it much more um, thorough and therefore much more invasive. And we rushed to deploy it, what, what I'll say euphemistically the agency now calls advanced imaging technology, what was commonly referred to in the press in 2010 and 2011 as the naked body scanners, right? Um, uh, and we moved them, the original intent was that those devices would be used for resolving alarms as a secondary security measure, but because of this threat, we moved, the agency moved forward to try and install those devices at every checkpoint, at every screening lane, and to use them as, as the primary security measure. And that, those decisions resulted in a lot of ethical dilemmas or questions that needed to be answered. How thorough do you make the pat-down process? Do you really want to be conducting a law enforcement style pat-down on elderly, on children, on infants? Do you want to be doing that in a public setting? What's the implications on the reputation of the agency and government, the compliance of the passengers? Because the AIT at that point showed a raw scanning image to the officer, how do you protect the privacy of the passenger from that image being viewed more broadly by, by anybody else that's standing on the checkpoint? And so we took a series of decisions and we moved forward trying to strike the balance between the security proposition and the impact on privacy and, and, and civil liberties and, and, and the passenger experience. But at that point in time, the agency was really driven by this underlying philosophy that anyone could be a threat and therefore everyone needed to be treated essentially the same way. So we talked earlier on, on the, the Dean's panel about equity. So there, we were going to equitably apply the thought that any passenger presented an unknown level of threat and therefore we needed to treat them as if they could be a terrorist operative. And so we had to apply those procedures broadly to the roughly two million passengers every day that comes through um, the, the TSA checkpoints. And the reaction to that was, was was decidedly negative from every corner. Passengers revolted, you know, you all remember the don't touch my junk, you know, headlines out of San Diego. Industry reacted negatively because we saw a decrease in, in the number of, of individuals that were willing to travel by air as a result of the more invasive, cumbersome, uh, um, security procedures, the airports objected because security lines were getting longer. 
and Congress rejected, and there was uh, there there were a lot of uh, members of our oversight committees at that time that were actively talking about um, let's do away with TSA, let's go back to a privatized screening model, let's turn aviation security back over to the airlines uh, um, and make them primarily responsible under a regulatory oversight of of the agency, um, kind of the pre 9/11 aviation security model. Um, and so as we got into 2010, um, the agency was really, really facing a crisis. We were seeing downward pressure on appropriations. We had all of this negative reaction from the traveling public and industry and, and Congress. Um, we saw a decline in performance. The job complexity of the officer was going up as we kept layering more and more technology and more and mo more invasive procedures in order to, to stay on top of what, uh, whatever the latest threat was. And we were really on a, on a trajectory to lose the security proposition. And so there was a kind of a, a confluence of things that came together in the latter part of 2010 that led the new administrator of the agency, John Pistol, to consider an alternative approach. What if we didn't assume that every, everyone posed an equal and unknown threat? How could we begin to separate individuals based on the risk that they actually presented or the threat that they actually presented? What information, so, and, and so we moved forward and began to explore um, uh, what would shifting to a risk-based security model for passenger screening um, look like? And that, that presented a whole set of additional questions. Not that the first questions weren't still important and won't be important in the future as terrorists continue to evolve and try and overcome what, you know, uh, uh, whatever we're doing. But, um, but now we needed to, to talk about what's the level of risk that the government is willing to accept? What should we be guarding against? Do we guard against any threat to the aircraft or a passenger on the aircraft? Or is our mission to really prevent that catastrophic consequence, the aircraft from being destroyed in flight with the loss of, of, uh, of everyone on board? Um, uh, if we are going to take a risk judgment, what information can, are we comfortable in government using in order to be able to make that risk judgment? In some cases, some of the earlier um, uh, uh, populations that were eligible to participate was the, the members of the national intelligence community, individuals that worked for the government or government contractor that had top secret security clearance. Government knew a lot, uh, still knows a lot about me by virtue of the fact that I had to have a top secret clearance in order to do my job. And so it was easy to say that's a population that we have deemed to be highly trusted and very low risk and let's begin to treat them differently than, than everyone else that comes through the checkpoint. But as you look at one of, one of the things that we adopted was this idea of a threat continuum. Uh, and on the left-hand side, we have the individual that the government un knows is a known or suspected terrorist operative. Those are the folks that need to get more thorough screening as if we're going to allow them on an airplane. And on the right-hand side of the spectrum are the folks like your top secret clearance holders that pose an essentially no risk at all. I would be willing to, to state that like most of you in this room, when you fly, your motivation is to simply get from your departure airport to your destination as safely and securely and with the least amount of inconvenience and hassle as is possible. The vast majority of the traveling public, 99 plus percent, represents no threat to aviation. But we're treating them under the old model as if they posed an unknown threat to aviation. So how do we begin to, to segment them out? If I'm going to take a risk judgment, should, be, what, should I be using only information held by government? Or should I be looking at social media information? Should I be looking at information from credit bureaus or information that are held by the airlines? Where has the government gone too far in its use of information that's available from multiple sources in order to make that, that risk judgment? 
And then once I make that judgment, what am I willing to back off on as far as the physical security requirements that we would require those identified lower risk passengers um, to, to go through? So the model that we adopted was really um, uh, earlier, uh, um, uh, uh, Dean Yordas talked about you know, the, the three circles of is it legal, is it ethical, is it smart? We, we really adopted a, a five criteria model. You know, we hear a lot of uh, political and uh, um, leaders and I'll, I'll say executives uh, uh, in the, uh, the career, um, career executives in government talk about, it, you know, it's all about security. Well, quite frankly, it will never be all about security. You know, security is important, but it is not the only thing. If you look at TSA's mission, it is to secure the nation's transportation systems while facilitating the legitimate movement of people and commerce. If it's all about security, then you will strangle the legitimate movement of people and commerce. So you're making these risk trade-off decisions as you, as you move forward. So the, three, the five criteria that, that we adopted in the model and can, is continuing to, to be used today are, first of all, what's the security proposition of the change? Am I improving the ability of the officer to find that catastrophic threat device? Secondly, what's the impact on the individual traveler? What's the experience of the traveler as they're going through that new requirement? Third, what is the efficiency of the, uh, the change, the impact on the operational efficiency of the checkpoint? You know, we saw what happened in 2016 when, because of some political pressures, TSA backed off on some of the risk-based security and the, you know, 45 minutes, uh, 60 minute, 90 minute wait times in Chicago as a result of, uh, you know, so we made policy changes without understanding the, operational efficiency impact. We had already stripped 5,000 frontline security officers out of the system because of the efficiency gains we were getting through uh, uh, risk-based security, and, it, and we couldn't replace them uh, immediately. Uh, the fourth criteria is um, what's the impact on industry? Is this going to see, uh, uh, you know, there, there are several academic studies that point to the, the security programs that the government put into place following 9-11 caused an immediate 6% uh, decline in the number of people that were willing to um, travel by air after air travel had, uh, had recovered about a year and a half or two years after 9-11. After and then the fifth criteria is really gets to the, the ethical question, the legal question, the moral question, as well as is it fiscally possible? Do we have the appropriations, the funds in order to be able to move forward? That model, I think, serves well. Those questions, whether it was the questions that I, I the, confronted the agency during one size fits all or the questions, the new questions that needed to be addressed during risk-based security, those are important sorts of questions that as I look at the threat of terrorism over the next five or 10 years and let something miraculous happens are the sorts of ethical dilemmas that the agency will face from a public policy perspective. Thanks. Thank you, everybody, and uh, do appreciate being a part of this fantastic uh, discussion today, this wonderful conference, and it's always so interesting to hear from everyone's perspectives. Everyone's so deep into the ethical dilemmas that their you know, respective careers uh, uh, expose them to and, and force them to grapple with, and, and I'm going to do the same here a bit today and talk about the experience of serving as an elected official in this day and age of, uh, of, uh, of social media and, and 24-hour uh, news cycle, but then also the extraordinary role that money plays in politics, and just raise some ethical issues that my experience have have got me thinking about, and a couple of possible solutions. Um, let me let me first uh, kind of riff a little bit off of what Vint mentioned with regards to norms and rules, and there's no question that there is something to be said for help hoping that people act in the right way, in the moral way, uh, because it's the right thing to do. And there's no question that even, you know, even in politics, even among politicians, uh, there are, are, there's, there's a constant grappling with moral dilemmas and moral challenges. And, and I think the vast majority of people who are in the field try really hard to, 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 to connect with their, their moral core and behave in a moral way. 
But there's no question that the job constantly brings up moral dilemmas, ethical challenges, et cetera. And it's one of the reasons why it's so important to have strong rules in place. And I will say that the rules and the norms interact with each other all the time. Rules help to govern behavior because people are afraid of being punished. Uh, but as the, as the behavior changes and evolves, that helps to also shape the norms as you move along. So there was a day uh, not that long ago when across the street from the California State Capitol at the Senator Hotel, uh, there, uh, every legislator had uh, access to an open tab at the bar uh, paid for by some special interest. There were literally prostitutes on retainer, uh, you know, outrageous, ridiculous, and there would be people who would then shuttle the legislators back to the floor to vote uh, for whatever issue that was, was up coming up at the time and people who would be monitoring the floor. Now, so this was, this was what was going on at, at, at some point. People were able to take, uh, 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 they were able to be paid personally to give a speech. I could show up here or show, more likely show up in front of a uh, uh, kind of some sort of special interest group and, and be able to ask for a $50,000 fee to speak to give you the, 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 the great pleasure to hear, hear my thoughts. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, great question. <laughs> so, uh, you know, the rules have changed, right? We have, we have changed considerably. We have changed the rules considerably in terms of personal uh, enrichment. Now legislators are not allowed to receive any honoraria associated with their speaking. Uh, they are uh, they're absolutely not, uh, they, they, they are, uh, uh, there are very strict rules as to the gifts that can be given to a legislator. Uh, by a lobbyist, they're very strict. In the case of a lobbyist, um, you can only receive what's equivalent to $10 a month, so that, you know, and, and that has to be reported immediately. So when I went over, I brought my own bag lunch to a, an office at one point just a couple months ago, and I, I noticed they had a bunch of Coke, you know, Diet Cokes on the, on the side, and I, I, I wanted to have one, and, and they said, well, look, you know, you're welcome to it, but we really ask you to please give us a dollar for the Diet Coke. Uh, because we don't want to deal with the paperwork associated with the reporting. So, um, yeah. you know, th that, and by the way, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Um, as, as, as much of a hassle as it can appear, it's so important to set up rules and norms that help to protect against those kinds of behaviors that existed in the past. Uh, we also have real rules about the extent to which you can have a conversation about public policy at the same time that you're talking about fundraising. You're not allowed to talk about policy at a fundraiser. Uh, you know, policy, at least, that is kind of directly relating to lobbying. And you can talk more broadly. Uh, you're also, uh, when you're making phone calls to fundraise, you can't talk about policy and, uh, and, 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 and you know, fundraising uh, on the same call. You can hang up the phone and call them back and to talk about fundraising five minutes later. And you know what? That sounds ridiculous, but I, I'm glad that, at the very least, we require people to do that. I'm glad that people in the legislature are concerned that they're offices may be tapped by the FBI uh, for ethical reasons, not because of them themselves, but because of previous uh, mistakes and problems and, and terrible decisions made by some of our colleagues. But it's a good thing that people uh, are, are worried and, and are thinking about the rules and making sure that they comply with the rules, because I think it, it does help to improve behavior over time. It's too bad that we need to set things up like this, but the stakes are so high and the, the passions run so high as well. And what's interesting about politics is that oftentimes it's morally driven work. You know, you have a, a moral uh, a predisposition to try to fight for the poor or fight for the workers or fight for the unborn or fight for, uh, for, for capitalism or free market values. Uh, these are all values that you have. These are values that are oftentimes deeply tied into your ethical and moral values. And sometimes it's easy to think that people on the other side of the political spectrum don't share those values because there's something almost morally bereft about them. And if you look at the way that we sometimes talk about each other across the, the, the political spectrum, we're making ethical charges against our opponents from time to time. That person isn't compassionate. That person doesn't care about the poor. That person doesn't care about freedom or about individual liberty. And, and as a result, they are, they are morally uh, bereft. And so uh, when we are playing ball in this high stakes, complicated, power driven arena, it's so important to have rules in place that help to control uh, uh, people's behavior. Now, what's interesting, what, what has changed 
from, so we no longer have the, the, the Senator Hotel exists across the street and it's a rather bland and boring building filled with offices and you know, whatever legacy from the past uh, seems to have been wiped away. Uh, but there's no question that there continue to be a tremendous number of moral dilemmas that face legislators today. And I think that so many of them come down to the role of money in politics. Uh, you know, we have a, a, we have a set of rules that govern legislators' fundraising that, by the way, are deeply problematic, I think. Uh, we certainly can no longer personally enrich ourselves, and there are rules about the time delay that you have to put in place before you can go into lobbying or some kind of government relations work after you serve in the legislature, and you certainly can't take honoraria to enrich yourself. Uh, people can't, make, can't give you, you know, big gifts to, to you, but they certainly do give to your campaign, and the campaign Cam the campaign accounts are a vitally important part of the political process that you rely on for your power and your ability to grow as an elected official. And, um, and, and now, I will say, in the context of the campaign contributions, at the very least, for a politician, you have limits on what you can take personally, and all of those contributions have to be disclosed. Who's giving the contribution, how much they're giving, and then how you're spending your money as well. That's all disclosed and available for the public. Any one of you right now can go online, right on your phones, find out how much money I've raised for my campaign account, who I've raised it from, how I've spent my money, et cetera. Now, you know, I still think that there are deep problems in this current system. I think that, it, that some of it, you know, it comes, it comes a little too dangerously close to legalized corruption from my perspective. There, uh, uh, because we, are, we spend so much time running money, uh, raising money as legislators. As, as Jess Unruh said, it's the, the mother's milk of politics. And I'm going to quote him one more time on, on another issue uh, in a second, a more, maybe a more, more racy uh, uh, quote. Because Jess Unruh also said uh, that if you can't, and this is his line, not mine, so don't get mad at me, but he said, uh, it's, a, it's obviously a throwback to, to a different era, a former Speaker of the House, but he said, if you can't drink their liquor, screw their women, take their money, and then vote against them on the floor the next day, you don't belong in politics. So his whole point, of course, is that you, know, you have to find a way as a politician to be able to separate all of that influence and, and, and support that you're getting from people you know, from your actual work as an elected official. But I'll tell you, I, I, I wonder sometimes whether people are able to do it. At the very least, when you talk about the candidate-run campaign contribution system, at the very least, there is accountability, there's transparency, there are limits. Uh, there's a, a, an interesting debate about limits, by the way. Um, I tend to believe that it's good to limit campaign contributions because it does make it so that no one individual contributor has too much influence over a politician. The flip side, of course, is used to be back in the day, if you were a labor guy, the labor federation would write you one big check, that's all you basically needed to run your operation, and then you didn't have to spend the rest of your time raising money from other people. Everybody knew you were bought and sold by labor or by whatever interest group that might have been. But on all the other issues you vote on, you could actually have some independence. <laughs> now, we're forcing people to spend all their time talking to every different group under the sun, which, you know, the, and there's two different ways of looking at this. On the one hand, it may be, it, it may, maybe it makes you too beholden to too many different interests and, and ties the hands of the legislature to, to work in the public's interest. Uh, the flip side, of course, is maybe by taking money from everybody, uh, that mitigates the impact of any one individual influencer. Now, you know, this all, of course, you know, this is a, a, a dark picture I'm painting uh, that it really does come down to the role of money in politics. And, uh, and by the way, when I talk about, you know, at least on the case of the campaign contribution limits, you know, that's all stuff that the candidates have control over and the public has some disclosure over. There's a whole other world that has been allowed by the Supreme Court through jurisprudence that was most recently codified in the Citizens United decision that equates free speech with money. So, so money, so the expenditure of money for political posturing or positioning is connected to, to, to constitutionally protected free speech. Now, uh, now you know, Unfortunately, uh, I mean, we had hoped, I think, with an with, uh, with, with amendment that we put on the ballot, Proposition 57, that I was very involved with, that that could be part of an effort to ultimately overturn Citizens United, that it could be used as part of the dicta of a future Supreme Court that would overturn Citizens United. And I think uh, the expectation was um, Hillary Clinton was talking quite a bit about that on the campaign trail, and if she had won, 
uh, perhaps you know, the, the Supreme Court might have moved in a different direction. But of course, things didn't turn out that way, and it seems as though Citizens United is with us for, for, for the long run. Now, the question becomes, uh, uh, if, if, if we're not going to be able, and, and I'll say that, that, that what Citizens United allows, that's, in, that's, that's even worse than our campaign finance system that I just described, it allows folks to go off on their own with literally no limits and much less transparency. It oftentimes takes quite a long time to figure out who the heck is paying for uh, some of these independent expenditures that oftentimes create these wonderfully Orwellian names like Californians for apple pie and happy puppies. And you know, you'll get these mailers in the mail that will uh, you know, fill up your mailbox and will you know, attack or support a candidate. And at the very least, when it's coming from a candidate, you, you can hold that candidate accountable or responsible for the messaging, and you can go and quickly find out where that candidate's money's coming from. But in the case of these independent expenditures, these super PACs, these outside forces, uh, you know, you, 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 it's much harder to do that. And, and uh, by the way, like the candidates themselves are not even allowed to speak to these independent expenditures. I think that there's a, there's a lot of good reasons for that because we want to make sure that the independent expenditures are truly independent. But for a candidate, it's a very kind of frightening experience that you have people out there attacking you or supporting you that are you know, promoting messages that may not be in line with your message or your values or your interests. And uh, it can be a, a really rather bewildering experience. I can, I can say that from personal experience. So one of the questions is, how do we make sure at the very least, if we're not going to be able to overturn Citizens United tomorrow, how do we make sure that we at least provide the public with the tools they need to better understand who it is that's messaging to them, so that at the very least they can, they can evaluate the messages that are being presented to them? And that's through disclosure. Uh, at least that's the best thing we've come up with so far. And you know, of course, Justice Louis Brandeis wrote that sunlight is said to be the best of disinfectants. And we're trying to our best to, to create rules that let the sunshine in, that, that do provide a certain amount of disclosure. Um, though I will say, anyone who's ever watched a pharmaceutical ad with all those happy people, you know, eating, a, having a picnic with nice music playing as they describe the extraordinary number of, of side effects that could be visited upon you from all sorts of terrible forms of diarrhea to, um, you know, to, uh, to heart failure uh, uh, if, if, you were to, if you were to start taking their drug and only use as directed. But, uh, but ultimately, the pharmaceutical industry has somehow found that it's still better, uh, it, you know, with all that disclosure of all these terrible parades of horribles, uh, that, that it's still better to advertise. So I, I, the point I'm making is that disclosure for disclosure's sake isn't always really going to impact people. And, and all you got to do is look at the ubiquity of these Proposition 65 warnings. Every single thing you do um, is, is apparently, you know, carcinogenic. So uh, what, we are, what we're trying to do is, is trying to figure out legislation that will provide meaningful cues and clues to voters so that they can evaluate the messaging out there. So one was the recent passage of the California Disclose Act, so that when you do get messages and flyers and TV ads from independent expenditures, the top three donors to those campaigns, to those independent expenditures have to be very clearly, and not in tiny print, but in big print, have to be disclosed to you so that you at least know who is, uh, who, who, who's, who's paying for the messaging. Uh, similarly, I have a bill, that passed, that was finally signed into law, very tough process, but we finally got it through. I have a bill that, I'm, that I think is the next generation of this that focuses on the, dis on the petition process. When you just, you're going down to Whole Foods, and I'm from Santa Monica, you know, we're just trying to get a little, uh, you know, quinoa and kale and farro, the three food groups in Santa Monica, and um, you know, you, and, and, and someone you know thrusts a petition into your hands and says that this petition is going to save Western civilization as we know it. Um, if you sign, you know, and, and little do you know sometimes, and little do they know that it, the whole thing is being paid for by one particular special interest of trying to get a carve out in the law to help their business proposition or their their business model. And at the very least, we want to make sure that 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 the donors to those petition drives are disclosed as well. I think that these are some little ways that we can help to uh, improve the system. We're trying to you know, uh, update the overburdened and antiquated campaign finance website at the, at the Secretary of State's office, but ultimately really focus on trying to bring some sunshine in uh, and, and ultimately, but ultimately move toward uh, a change in our constitutional posture that will help to reduce the pervasive and pernicious role that money plays in our political system. So appreciate everyone's time and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me. And I think uh, Senator Allen and I didn't talk before, but I think I'll act essentially as his foil. So to the extent that you weren't totally depressed by his discussion, I'm here to try and make sure that like you need pharmaceuticals at the end of this because you're just so <laughs> sad. So. Um, 
I wanted I want to kind of ditch my prepared speech to a small extent, but I want to pick up on a couple of broader themes. And so the first is what are governmental ethics laws? So as Ali said, I teach at Loyola Law School. I teach government ethics. I'm president of the LA Ethics Commission until I'm blissfully termed out in a few months. And um, in my feeling after dealing with this area of the law for a number of years is that government ethics are basically laws that try and guard against human nature. And they're basically, I mean, they're very complicated and they're, you know, there's so many different regulations and then letters about what the regulations mean and then interpretations about what the letters of the regulations mean. But what it really boils down to is we understand that people who serve in government, whether they're hired or appointed or elected are not saints and that they might try and serve themselves instead of serving us. And I think that this whole framework of law is basically to say, uh, we don't really trust you all that much and thank you for that. And so, again, what are we trying to guard against? I think it's that old saying that I learned when I was in seventh grade, that power can corrupt. Or the true saying is absolute power can corrupt, absolutely. And, you know, I don't worry about that with some of our elected officials, Senator Allen, but I do with others, and for good reason. And so I think that, again, what we're trying to prevent is you are in a position of power, please don't use it for your own gain, and please don't try and take the accoutrements that come with that position for your own gain. So the first thing that I was actually gonna talk about is um, what I focus on most when I teach, which is campaign finance laws. And these laws I view basically as a version of ethics laws, if you think about it, and so, one of the things we were talking about at our speaker's dinner last night is like, when do we get these laws? We only really get ethics laws when there's just been a scandal and it's politically expedient for someone to say, you know what I should do? I should propose an ethics law. No offense whatsoever. So <laughs> what happens is, if you look at every jurisdiction on the local level in LA, in the state level, on the federal level, you can trace when did they create and implement their ethics laws to when was there a horrendous mm -hmm. scandal. Mm -hmm. On the federal level, we really didn't have many laws until a little thing called Watergate. And that largely was a campaign finance scandal. And that's why we have kind of, the Congress decided we need a number of tools in our tool shed to be able to guard against the pernicious influence of money in politics. And basically, Congress said we need contribution limits because we think there's something inherently corrupting. If I can walk over to you and say, here's $200,000, but and I represent PG&E, but use it however you see fit and don't feel like I'm trying to unduly influence you. And then there's expenditure limits. And those were intended to serve a different purpose, basically saying to people, we don't want you to be on this endless fundraising treadmill. We want there to be a certain amount of money that you can spend, and that's it. And part of the reason that Congress talked about this was to actually say it's not just about preventing corruption, it's also about equality. Part of ethics as an umbrella is not just what looks corrupt or what is corrupt, but it's also trying to make the political system look like it's accessible to everybody, not just everybody who's a good fundraiser. And then there were other laws dealing with public campaign financing, essentially kind of the same idea, which is we think we should try and take the influence of private money out of the political process. You should be a good candidate and win if you're a good candidate, not if you're a good fundraiser. And then we had uh, disclaimer and disclosure provisions, which was essentially trying to say, you know what, it's really good if the public can try to connect dots. For instance, say, look at all the contributions that this one elected official is having. Look at what their uh, particular policy positions are. Do we think there's a problem there? Now, the Supreme Court, in its infinite wisdom, decided, you know what, every time you spend money in politics, it's the equivalent of speaking. So we're gonna come down and put the First Amendment rubric over this area of the law which is a short way of saying, every time you try and regulate money in politics, the court will treat it like you trying to say, uh, you're not allowed to say certain things. The court will treat it like you're actually limiting somebody's speech. 
And I think that's why we ultimately have the Citizens United decision. That's why we have so many other decisions that have allowed for this flourishing of money in our, um, in our political system. One thing I would say also in looking at campaign finance laws is that we see this kind of very disheartening ethical cycle. So what we have is we have scandal, ethical laws, challenge to those laws in the courts, striking down of those laws in the courts, and then people will find ways around those laws. And I think that's the thing that we are largely struggling with is that many of these laws in, in California on the federal level, I see it as president of the LA Ethics Commission, is that many, uh, a large part of the cycle is just a game of whack-a-mole because, um, and I say this as someone who tries to train smart lawyers, get a smart lawyer and try and find a way around the current regulation. And this brings up you know, a host of practical and ethical issues. So one thing I wanted to do is talk about you know, these campaign finance laws, which I largely see as we kind of don't trust you with too much money. So let's try and take money out of the political system. And I would just say with all the confidence in the world, we've been so terrifically disastrous at trying to achieve that goal. And then there's, I actually view other election laws as a type of ethics laws in a sense. So both laws, for instance, we can think of a different area. Laws that make it harder to vote and laws that make it easier to vote. So laws that make it harder to vote, we can think about voter ID laws. What's the purpose of a voter ID law? Don't steal the election by unethically and fraudulently going into the ballot box and saying, for instance, uh, I have I have a colleague who I'm neighbors with who's named Lori Levinson. We always joke, what's to prevent us from going in? Well, because neither one of us want to lose our bar card, basically. But because the idea is we're guarding against um, people trying to steal elections. Same with laws on the other side of the books that actually make it easier to vote. The idea in that case is we're guarding against unethical state lawmakers who are trying to infringe on your right to um, exercise your right to vote. But what I would say is, and we see this in terms of, we see laws regarding redistricting, how you draw ballot, excuse me, how you draw legislative district lines. And if we wanna look at an ethical pattern for these laws that make it harder to vote and these laws that make it easier to vote, I would say the pattern I see is lawmakers like to use the levers of power to keep their jobs, and that's human nature. And I don't know how much of that is fair to criticize them for. But voter ID laws are introduced by Republicans because they tend to harm Democrats. Laws that make it easier to exercise your right to vote, for instance, early voter registration, more voting centers, uh, voting for the first two weeks before an election, those are almost invariably introduced by Democrats because Democratic voters tend to avail themselves of those avenues. And so, you know, lawmakers, I think, generally try and grasp this moral high ground, but election laws are really about trying to use, again, I think, the levers of power, the machinery of government, in order to try and keep power. And that's not necessarily unethical. I think people want to keep power because they say, I have a really good idea for how we can change public education. I have a really good idea for how we can overhaul the immigration system. I'm really worried about climate change. And the way I can implement my particular worldview, which I know is kind of a smart and normatively good worldview, is to try and keep my job. And here's how I'm gonna keep my job. I'm gonna draw my district line this way, and I'm gonna raise money from these particular people. So that's what I wanted to talk about first with respect to um, statutory laws, both campaign finance laws and then voting rights laws. One thing I wanted to bring up because it's been in the news this week is there's actually constitutional ethics laws too. If And the one I'm thinking most about is something that we probably didn't hear a whole lot about in November 2016, and then we started to hear a lot more about it starting in December 2016, which is the emoluments clause. And our Constitution basically has a couple of different of these so-called emoluments clauses. And there's a domestic clause, and there's a foreign clause. 
And it's complicated, and they've never been litigated for a variety of reasons. There's no Supreme Court case law on these clauses. But what they come down to is, President, for, particularly with respect to the Foreign Emoluments Clause, please don't take money from foreign heads of state or foreign governments. For obvious reasons, because we don't, why should we trust that situation? We want you to serve the American public. We don't want you to be indebted to foreign heads of state or foreign nationals. And so please don't take that money or those gifts or those benefits. And because of our current atmosphere, um, because of our current administration, people are finding kind of creative ways to try and stop what they view as unethical behavior. And so one of the new avenues we're using is like the oldest, most arcane avenue in the book, literally, which is let's sue under the emoluments clause. I mean, I taught election law for a number of years. I never had a discussion about like, let's talk about the foreign emoluments clause. Now it's a big part of what I talk about for kind of obvious reasons. And so the news on that is um, the suit is going forward and we don't know where it's going after that. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and wrap up quickly. So we talked about what are ethics laws, and then the next thing I wanna talk about, which I've already said is basically, who are we trying to protect? We're trying to protect the public from ourselves, and what I really mean by ourselves is our representatives. The people who we appoint, the people who we hire, the people who we elect, with the understanding that, what, we want them to serve us, and not themselves. We don't want them to go to city hall or state capital or the nation's capital to enhance their own agenda. They want, we want us to serve, we want them to serve our constituents. And so and the last big thing I wanna talk about is what are we trying to balance? And I've also alluded to this a little bit before, but what we're trying to balance on the one hand, I think it is, very obvious to us. We're trying to prevent corruption in government. We're trying to uh, create a situation where people have faith in the integrity of our election processes and faith in the integrity of how our government functions. And you know, please nobody laugh because that actually is our, um, that is our goal. Now, on the other hand, there's something that um, I worry about, particularly as my on my years as the LA Ethics Commission, and that is Senator Ben Allen worrying about his Diet Coke. And so you said, I, you know, I understand why we do that. But I say, on the other hand, I don't want to regulate people into paranoia. And I don't want to basically legislate people into inaction. Because corruption can lead to bad policy outcomes, but so can an overwhelming fear of an ethical violation, let's say. And so part of, I mean, your Diet Coke example was better. I mean, part of what I worry about is, so I, for at least a few more months, cannot accept any money from lobbyists. And money includes anything of value. Now, if I take my toddler to the park and there's a parent there who says, you know what, your kid really loves this tricycle. I, my kid doesn't use a tricycle anymore. Take it home. It's new, take it home. If I don't ask, like, hey, is there any chance you're a registered lobbyist in LA? <laughs> uh, now, all of a sudden, I'm a potential LA Times story about President of the LA Ethics Commission violates. <laughs> and I think that's a little absurd. I'm not going to not do my job because I received the tricycle from a fellow lobbyist. And that's kind of an, a, not that distant from my real life example, but. One other thing that I worry about, and you brought this up, and I wasn't going to bring this up in case it was a sore subject, a lot of what elected officials have to do is raise money to spend money for lawyers to make sure that they're in compliance. So I'm worried about two things with respect to your Diet Coke. One is that you're giving brain space to, should I take this Diet Coke? Should I give a dollar? Because I do talk to elected officials who say, you know what, I went to this law firm to talk, but then I realized there's some registered lobbyists there, so then I went to get my 
validation validated, but then I was like, oh my God, it's $36 to park in this building, and now all of a sudden that's a real sum of money. And this conversation is something I never want to have with an elected official. I want them to say, how can I make your kid's school better? How can I fix your road? How can I work on homelessness? I don't want them thinking about the validation. Now, another part of that is you have to, a lot of these ethics laws, which I absolutely believe we need to a certain extent, are fair employment acts for lawyers. So Senator Allen spends uh, a huge chunk of what I would say is a professor's salary on compliance and on basically paying lawyers to make sure that you don't fly in the face of any of these ethics laws. And this brings up a somewhat related point, which is we're not worried about Senator Allen because he's worried about complying. What we're worried about is the people who are basically operating in the shadows, who are outside the system, and who are trying to find ways to not comply. So um, with that, I spent way, I, I promised everyone, oh, I, I don't think I have more than four minutes. So um, <laughs> I lied, but this is an ethics conference, so get used to it, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you for having me here today. Uh, my name is Timothy Blute, and I represent the mm -hmm. National Governors Association, which, for those of you who don't know, is the nonpartisan voice of the nation's governors. So uh, we're based in Washington, D.C., and we advocate on behalf of the governors to the federal government, but more than that, we also provide policy best practices to governors to help them do their jobs better and help them implement smart, best promising practices across a whole range of issues. So I, uh, in that role, I direct our technology policy work, and before that, I worked at the FBI, sort of on the intersection of technology and security policy. And I think in these two roles, I've witnessed a number of challenges to ethical decision making. So I'm going to highlight a couple of them, but I want to start with the premise that, in my experience, the vast majority of the public officials that I've worked for and with are attempting to do the right thing. So I think with that as the beginning premise, I want to think about the challenges that they face in the course of doing that. So the first one, and this came up this morning, is what do we do when what's ethical and what's legal don't necessarily overlap? This is particularly acute in national security, in homeland security, where the statutes that govern our actions are old, they're ambiguous, they were drafted long before we had the internet, long before we had cell phones. So what do we do when the statute, interpreted by well-meaning lawyers, says you can do X, but maybe X isn't the most ethical thing to do? That's an easy, well, it's hard, but it's an easier exercise if you're thinking about that in the classroom or at a symposium like this. It's hard, it's very hard, when you're doing it in the intelligence community or in a state homeland security enterprise and you're thinking, if I don't take advantage of the leeway that I have, if I don't do what the lawyers tell me I can do, someone may be hurt. Something may be destroyed, people may die. That's a really, really tough quandary and I can tell you that's something that people are struggling with every single day. That's really one of the big challenges I've seen in the national security and the homeland security and public safety community. The second one, and I think this is across all levels of government, is long-term versus short-term decision making. Public officials, right or wrong, act in one, two, four-year time frames, depending on what their election cycles are. <clears throat> In the world that I work in, it's even more than that because if the governor has four years or eight years to think, they've got to think about their one year or even shorter budget cycle. So how do they make those decisions? What do they do when they have the opportunity to make a decision that right now helps their political outlook or helps their state's short-term budget scenario, but long-term has negative implications? Or the flip side, do they make a decision right now and this is the much harder case, right now they make a decision that hurts a constituency that's a little bit of a pain point today, but they know in 8, 10, 20, 30 years it's better for their state. That's a real challenge when we elect our public officials and we, they're human, right? They want to get reelected. They want to stay in office. So we see that as being a challenge across the board that they have to work through. The third challenge um, I wrote down is sort of the ethics of efficiency. And I think we've talked a lot about this morning about technology and the technological problems that we're all going to face. This one strikes me as something that's going to become even more acute in government. There is a demand for government officials, a, a just demand to be stewards of the taxpayer funds, to be efficient, to deliver government services at a low cost. What happens when the allure of replacing some of the human functions with technology, it's there because it's gonna lower costs. I don't have to pay that person, they're never sick, they're not gonna need a pension, I don't have to pay their health care. but are there certain core functions of government that maybe we don't want a computer to do? 
Those are some questions I think that government is just beginning to focus on. The private sector has had to address that for, they've had a little bit of lead time on that. But I think as automation technologies, as artificial intelligence, as machine learning become more pervasive, and the costs of those and the accessibility of those make it so that government is more frequently having to say, well, wait a minute, I could have a human sentencing commission or I could develop an algorithm that makes that helps make that decision for me in the arena of corrections as an example. But all of a sudden I've got asked, do I want a computer deciding whether or not someone gets freedom or doesn't get freedom? Are there biases in that computer? So I think in government we're really at the beginning of having to tackle that decision, but I think it's going to grow. And then the last point, and I added this one this morning, but you know something I've really seen in my work at the National Governors Association is just the amount of information that's flowing into policymakers every day, and then the speed with which they're expected to make decisions. The amount of information is growing and the speed is decreasing. We're asking our public officials to take in not just information, you know, it's no longer just read a newspaper in the morning, watch the evening news, get a few briefings during the day, and have quite a bit of time to make a decision. Now, they're reading social media, they're getting influenced by online news sources, by tweets that they can't control, they're getting multiple newspapers, there's no such thing as a one day news cycle or a 24 hour news cycle. I'm sure the public officials here on the stage would agree. You know, it's a one minute news cycle, it's a one hour news cycle. And then they're being told by their constituents, by their advisors, that they have to make those decisions in even less time. And I think that presents a real challenge for our public officials, because we want them to make ethical decisions, but we're asking them to do it in less and less time. So they can't just say take the, take the headspace, take the time to sit down and go, what's right, what's wrong, what that's, what's ethical, what's legal? It's, wow, I've got all this information coming at me really, really quick, and I've got to make a decision like that. So these questions, I think, are not getting any easier. And I'll conclude by saying I'm a big believer in technology. I think it has the power to change the world in a lot of positive ways. But I think technology is going to exacerbate all four of these challenges. And I'm really excited to be here and to see this because I think if we want to continue to promote ethical decision making in public policy, it's going to require cooperation between our elected officials and our non-elected policymakers, universities like this, and also citizens who have to increasingly recognize that these challenges exist and maybe change the demands they place on policymakers to give them just a little bit more room to make ethical decisions. So thank you very much. Well, first of all, thank you very much, Ali, and, and I thank you for your tenacity and for uh, what you have put together this day is, is possible because of you and, of course, visionaries like my boss, the, the dean of my school, Jack Nod, and uh, Dean Ellis, as well as Dean Yortzas, who uh, put together this amazing interdisciplinary center, of course, with the gener generosity of the Neelys. So truly appreciative uh, uh, for that. Uh, when you have a bunch of lawyers on a panel, uh, you leave depressed, as they say, but I'm hoping to provide a little bit of hope uh, in this context here uh, in my presentation as uh, I chose uh, public policy over teaching at law school because I was blessed enough to be in the world of public interest uh, almost all of my adult life, both as a lawyer, um, first and then as an elected official and then of course as a professor in a public policy school. So whatever I think about, I always have in mind um, the public interest uh, especially. So my presentation is more about that and, and more about the concept of uh, today our technology really outpacing our ability to make law and outpacing our ability to make policy um, and not giving us the ability to catch up. So that's kind of the context in which, in fact, I wrote uh, a, a book chapter on this topic and using, if you will, my profession and my experience as a regulator of the medical field when I was serving during, during the Schwarzenegger administration, um, and also, of course, uh, as someone in now academics interested in the subject matter. So Jack and I did not actually trade notes about the subject matter of shootings and, uh, um, and uh, particularly the police shootings that we've seen. But I've always wondered um, about the subject matter because, as you might remember, in Dallas, um, the law enforcement used a robot actually to kill uh, a suspect. So the robocop that you see uh, on your screen now, the question then becomes, do we load into the robocop uh, the, um, the Fourth Amendment? Uh, 
Um, because if we don't, uh, then do we create artificial intelligence who's smarter than us and does not abide by the same rules that us humans are supposed to abide by? So that makes me wonder, and certainly, of course, the United States Supreme Court has spoken about this topic back in the 80s when it uh, decided a couple of seminal cases um, in uh, Tennessee, uh, one of them, of course, being Tennessee versus Garner, and the other one, of course, being the case of Graham versus Connor. Both of those cases relate to uh, uh, what the Supreme Court said, putting a bullet in someone is the epitome of seizure, therefore, under the Fourth Amendment, a violation of someone's uh, Fourth Amendment right, if, in fact, they were under certain guidelines. So... I, based on that, I thought that um, perhaps, as, um, as Dean Yortzos earlier said, perhaps algorithms do need to be accountable. In other words, uh, algorithms perhaps need to, need to be loaded with the Fourth Amendment in order to preserve the public interest. And whatever I think about this, I'm also thinking about any kind of technology, um, but having the experience that I have, I focused my chapter on talking about techno innovations by looking at various professions that, uh, that I was very close to, and that of course being law and sitting as a regulator and ethics judge, if you will, in medicine and of course in my public service uh, as an elected official. Now, the easy part is the law. Uh, we all know uh, what the law is, and, and technically speaking, we should know as professionals what the law is uh, and abide by the law. But there are a couple of important things because one of my uh, esteemed colleagues in my school, Terry Cooper, who is a uh, foremost scholar on the subject matter of engagement and, and ethics, always says, and I'm a student of, of his all the time, uh, as I sit in, in various courses that he teaches, including some of uh, courses in my program for executive education, um, he says the law is the bare minimum, and he's right. But I noticed something about the law in my profession and in medicine uh, and also public service, as Ben alluded to, the responsibility of what we have. And one of those forms, uh, the FPPC rules, Form 700, is precisely to deal with potential conflicts of interest, where my life is an open book, as ben, Ben's is. I've served in uh, public office for 15 years. You can know anything about me if you just Googled my name, to just talk about Google. Um, to Google my name, uh, you would know everything about where I live, uh, how much well, generally how much I make, uh, generally what I spend on, what kind of investments I have, et cetera. So in essence, that's a good thing. And uh, 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 same with the doctors. We know what their professional Hippocratic Oath is. But I think about what I thought, when I thought about this and I was writing that chapter, I said, you know, laws and rules as we talk about norms are actually better than just the minimum when it comes to the profession of medicine, law, and public service. And by that, I remembered some words of a couple of folks that I actually met uh, in person. Uh, one of them swore me uh, into the bar of the United States Supreme Court, and that being Justice O'Connor uh, when I was in Washington, DC. Um, and they said something very interesting that I find uh, extremely helpful, perhaps, in this dialogue. I know it's a long quote, but I won't read the whole quote, but basically the essence, and feel free to read it, but basically the essence is that our profession as lawyers is not just based on the laws, but the responsibility of that person sitting on our shoulder to remind us as professionals of the public interest and to remind us that we are officers of the court which is a very important sentence in our responsibility and professional responsibility. In other words, it is very difficult to serve two different interests, but certainly the court tells us that as members of the bar, we are to serve the public interest as well as the interest of our client, and of course, do so zealously. And that's a very important responsibility 
because both Justice George, who was a, uh, uh, our uh, Supreme Court justice in, here in California, and Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, who views it the same way, view that our norms and our rules are more than that. And that's what I want to focus on, and that's what I want to say that hopefully when we look at technology and when we look at regulating this field, that we look not only to the laws or that we create laws, but, but we inspire those folks who are writing those algorithms or creating those innovations, that they look to the public interest just as well as their interest is writing those algorithms, algorithms or the, the laws that they are. So my hope in, in this is that it is true that it's much easier for those of us who have taken oath, oaths of our professional responsibilities to know what those laws are. But when I talk to students about this, I say, not one day in my entire 20 years of practice of law before I came to academia, like Dean Ellis, I came to academia after a professional life uh, outside of the university. I never thought about, frankly, the professional responsibility as a, something that guided just me. I always thought about, oh my God, what shame will I bring to my profession? if I did this or that. I always thought of it that way. So that probably becomes extremely helpful in writing technology, if you will. The inspirational piece, what I call it, of our professional responsibility and the rules uh, so that we look out for the public interest, which is not an easy thing to do. I always end my, uh, my talks, both in class and otherwise, uh, to say that, to especially to the young generations, I've enjoyed my life. I'm very blessed to have been an elected. And I always say, please serve. There's nothing better in public service, uh, nothing better in life than public service. And most of all, of course, enjoy. And I put that picture up there to make sure that uh, how good Ben Allen looks in a Rolling Hills estate jacket. So uh, <laughs> thank you very much. I truly appreciate the time. Well, um, we do have one question for each of the panelists, and the challenge is to answer in one minute. Uh -oh. So this is going to be, and for each of the panelists. So the first question is either Senator Ben Allen or Jessica Levinson. What stops people from funding PACs with small donations? Why don't we have more small donors participating in politics? Why, why do the elected officials go after the big guys? Yeah, well, well why don't we see more of them? in uh, politics. It's just harder to, to, you know, by definition, when you're raising money from fewer people, it takes less, you know, there's less conversations to have. But every once in a, you know, every once in a while, you get someone who catches fire and, and, and generates a lot of enthusiasm. But it just, it takes resources to reach out to lots and lots of people. And, um, you know, it's just a matter of scale. If I can call 10 people and raise $10,000 or call, you know, 150 people and raise $10,000, you know, the lower hanging fruit is to call the 10 people. What are your views on the Me Too movement and uh, the efforts that are being put in that direction? Um, yeah, every, everybody at the table is like, oh, I'm glad you got that one. Thank, thank you, Ollie, um, for that low-hanging fruit. So the Me Too movement, I think of as, I mean, so I'll give you a, a full answer, which um, is I think it's incredibly important. I think that there are, for instance, if we just take our state capital and what's happened in Sacramento, virtually every female that I talk to on a daily basis, whether it be a reporter or a legislative staffer or a lobbyist, uh, has some story of something ranging from uncomfortable to illegal that happened to her. So I guess I would say a couple things. One is I'm in a way amazed it took this long to talk about it. On another way, I'm amazed that we're still talking about it. Um, Another thing I would say is it's really important to separate activity that makes someone feel uncomfortable from activity that is illegal. And I think that particularly when it comes to election, elections and when it comes to situations where an accusation can now end a career, we have to be very circumspect about that. I would also say that, um, and I don't know how we do this well, but I think that we need to make sure that we tread lightly and in the sense that 
My career has been totally built on men being willing to hire me and be alone in rooms with me for long periods of time and not worry about that and not worry about how it looks. From when I was in law school, my constitutional law professor who said, come be my RA. And we spent a lot of time alone in his office together. I clerked for a federal judge. I worked at a small nonprofit. I was hired by the dean of law school. And every job I can trace back to basically a man feeling entirely comfortable being alone with me. And I don't want to get into a situation where women and the men who would hire them lose out on opportunities because it becomes too toxic to hire a woman and be alone in them. And particularly I'm thinking about a few conversations I've had with men in power who have said, you know, if I go out to lunch with a woman of a certain age or a single woman, now I feel like I have to bring someone. Guess who loses out? The woman doesn't have to get have a pri doesn't get to have a private conversation with that man, and vice versa. So I think it's incredibly important that we talk about it, that we separate what's uncomfortable from what's illegal, and that we keep in mind that we don't want to create a situation where it is so scary to be alone with women that women lose out on opportunities. Question for Ken Fletcher. To what extent do you believe the precautionary principle has prevailed in discussions and policy decisions uh, in domestic security versus benefit cost analysis? Um, I, think that, I think that environment is changing now. Um, there is, uh, I think we were motivated in the days and in, in years after 9-11 to be overly cautious. Um, to uh, to try and prevent all bad things from happening, rather than looking at the full spectrum of both the downside consequences and the upside opportunity. The traditional view of risk at the federal government level is has changed over the last two years from all risk is bad and it's a matter of prioritizing how you use your resources to manage the most important risks to buy them down to risk is simply a matter of uncertainty and how do you how do you manage your resources to reduce the uncertainty both from a downside consequences and an upside opportunity so that you're investing public resources to the greatest value of the people that you that you serve so i think th i think things are changing and will continue to change uh, this is a question for vint surf you see even when you're down there have been recent efforts of bad actors to manipulate Google, such as pre-filling searches to promote causes like the Holocaust denial and promoting bad information in search results, mm. like anti-vaccine. What should we do about that? So the first observation I would make is that we actually have a really hard problem uh, facing us, and here's why. Think about this. First of all, let me ask if, if those of you who are here in the room are familiar with something called the Turing test. You remember the imitation game movie? The Turing test was basically a human being, another human being, and a computer. And the human being, uh, the first one, is having uh, exchanges, messaging exchanges, just text, with both the human and uh, the computer. And the question is, can the human being who's asking the questions figure out which is the computer and which is the human? There was another variation where it was a man and a woman, you had to figure out which one was which. Well, if the computer manages to fool the questioner into thinking that the computer is human, then the computer has passed the Turing test. That's the classic example. Turing test two, there's a computer, and it is interacting with a human and a computer. And its job, its program, is trying to figure out which is the human and which is the computer. If it fails to do this, it has failed Turing test two. That's what we have right now, because we have software which is trying to figure out whether the content that we are getting, comments that we're getting, things that, that flow into uh, our platforms, is coming from a human or whether it's being generated by a botnet. And those of you, uh, I'm sure, have uh, discovered these things called CAPTCHAs. That's the thing where you're presented with this weird looking text and it's kind of obscured and the letters are all twisted around and we're trying to get you to say what, are, what is it that you're seeing in the hope that the humans will be able to figure it out and the computers won't. And that was an attempt to distinguish stuff coming from real people versus stuff being uh, amplified by a collection of computers that are simply repeating content. 
Well, it's a mixed bag in terms of our ability to make that distinction. And just to show you how making rules uh, generates uh, creativity and innovation, uh, one reaction to this cap CAPTCHA arrangement is for a program to take that portion, which is the CAPTCHA, and send it to a human being and have the human being figure out what the answer is and send the answer back and then reward that human being with something, you know, tokens, bitcoins, access to videos that they otherwise wouldn't get, things like that. So we are really hard pressed to algorithmically figure out uh, how to assess the statistics that we're seeing from people saying 20 million people uh, take this view and only 3 million people take that view, except actually it was only 2 million people who took this opposing view and 18 million bots. So the answer is we're working on it. But, uh, <laughs> but in fact, we've had more people, we brought in more people at Google to actually scrutinize a lot of the material, particularly in the case of YouTube because there are big issues there having to do with advertisers not wanting their advertisements to show up against things that, you know, that were somehow counter to uh, corporate principles. So unfortunately, uh, Turing Test 2 is still a challenge.